John Andrew Boehner, the 61st and current Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, giving us the good news of the Pope's visit in September 24, 2015. Uh, finally, on a happier note, a bit of good news. On September 24th, uh, His Holiness, Pope Francis, uh, will visit us here at the United States Capitol. Uh, that day, uh, His Holiness will be the first Pope in our history to address a joint session of Congress. Uh, we're humbled that the Holy Father has accepted our invitation and certainly look forward to receiving his message on behalf of the American people. Okay, greetings, York. It's... My name is Paul Stickle. I'm from I'm the webmaster at uh, Grand Design Exposed, and today we're going to have a broadcast. And uh, York is going to be uh, Michael's not here today, and um, and so York's going to host it. And we also have Tom Fress of Inquisition Updates. So it's all yours, uh, York. Yeah, thank you, Walt, for the small introduction, and welcome. Uh, everybody who's listening and maybe later on watching the video that's going to be made out of this broadcast to another episode of Nothing But The Truth. Today, as Paul Sticker already mentioned, with uh, Tom Fress as our highly valued guest once again, and uh, me running the show, and of course, Walt Stickle will here and there probably also will be one or another comment. As you have just heard from the introduction that uh, the Speaker of the House gave, uh, this year, 2015, will be brand marked as one of the most important years in modern history. And why is that? Well, I refer to the Bible directly, and Revelation chapter 13 of the Bible states the following, quote, And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now, everybody who knows a little bit about the Bible, or a lot about the Bible, knows that in Revelation 13, the Bible deals, or the prophecy of John, deals with two beasts. One beast that comes out of the sea, which in the Bible means a vastly populated area, multitudes, uh, multitudes of tongues and nations. And that stands for the Vatican. And then there came another beast in verse 11, coming out of the earth, and that stands for an uh, unpopulated area, and that is the Americas, the continent of America, and more specific in this case, the United States of America. That country was, before it was formed into a republic in 1776, consisting of 13 Protestant um, colonies. Protestant in that way that Catholics were not allowed to hold any office, they were not allowed to hold mass, and pagan holidays celebration like Christmas were forbidden. All that changed in the year 1776 with the founding of the United States of America, where the Jesuits introduced in the Constitution the freedom of religion. And that opened the door, not only for the religions like Islam or Buddhists or whatever, but most and for all it opened the door for the Catholics, that they could go their way. That's why the role the Carroll family played there, Daniel, John, and I always forget the third one. Charles. <laughs> Charles. 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 Thank you, Tom. Charles Carroll. They're very important in the founding of the United States, in the founding of Georgetown University, which is today the Jesuit held stronghold in Washington, and actually the place where all the laws are made for the United States of America, and what that means also for most of the rest of the world, which a lot of people are not aware of. Now, this day, uh, or these days, it was announced, as you heard in the beginning, in uh, introduction by Werner, 
that the Pope of Rome is going to visit the United States of America. And we have numerous recordings and talk shows like this already identified the Pope as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. This means that the Antichrist is coming to speak to a so-called Protestant nation. And to me, we can discuss this point, of course, but to me, that is the fulfilling of Revelation 13, chapter 13, verse 11, that the Lamb speaks as a dragon when it invites the Antichrist over to his place because, and this is something very important that uh, has to be said in the statements about the Pope visiting the United States, the Pope is coming to speak not only to a joint session of Congress, but he is also coming to speak on behalf of the American people. And that's what makes the nation, the Protestant nation, so-called United States of America, speak as a dragon. We have prepared, of course, a little bit for this broadcast. Tom has a lot to say, and by this I heartily welcome Tom Press from Inquisition Update to another broadcast of Nothing But The Truth. And the fulfilling of prophecy by the prophecy this year, right before our very eyes. Welcome, Tom. Oh, good. good day here. Nice to be with you and uh, anxious to uh, uh, prepare the American people or those who are listening uh, for one of the most, most historic events in our nation's history. Um, I suppose uh, uh, it would be best for me to reiterate what you said before, that just like in uh, May, I believe April, May of May of uh, 2008, when Pope Benedict XVI came to this country, our government displayed its perception of the papacy by its actions. Now, first of all, the President of the United States, George W. Bush, dispensed with all uh, White House protocol, and instead of meeting the Pope at the front door of the White House as he required, he left the White House and went to the airport and met Pope Benedict XVI on his turf, and uh, even allowed uh, American armed forces to carry the papal flag, violating military protocol, and then inviting him to the to the lawn of the White House and uh, serenaded him with the fife and drum corps, which is directly related to the Revolutionary War, signifying the importance of the Revolutionary War to the papal cause, literally heralding the papacy, the victor of the Revolutionary War, and then singing, uh, serenading the Pope with the Battle Hymn of the Republic, further indicating that the papacy owns this republic. And then finally, to cap it all off, if, if all that wasn't enough, to fire the papacy a 21-gun salute, which got its uh, significance from history when an opposing navy wished to surrender what it did was empty its magazines. In other words, fire all of its ammunition harmlessly out to sea. And once all of the ammunition was gone, then they were hauled into port. And their ships were boarded, and they were taken captive by their enemies. And traditionally, uh, the magazines held 21, 21 volleys. So in that perfect sense, 
when the United States government fired those 21 guns, it was a sign of, of, of surrender to the papacy. Virtually everything that happened on that, on that day in May of 2008 was historically significant. It told a history that has been hidden from the American people, from the Protestant people of this country. That the founding of this country, from its very beginning, was a victory for the papacy. Now, most people would say, well, Tom, that's just a bridge too far. And they cannot be convinced. And part of that is simply because they don't understand the Bible. And particularly Revelation chapter 13 in those very passages that you read in the introduction. The first beast rose up out of the sea, a sea of multitudes of peoples and nations and tongues and kindreds. That's the European continent. The first beast, the papacy, rose up out of Europe at the fall of the Caesars, which were the restrainers that Paul talked about in Second Thessalonians. When the Caesars of the old Roman Empire fell, what transpired was the immediate metamorp- uh, metamorphosis of, of, the ho- of the old pagan Roman Empire into the holy Roman Empire that we know today. And the Caesars became the popes. That was the first beast, and it caused the whole world to, to, to worship the Pope. The papacy had control of the kings of the earth. He seated and unseated the kings of Europe, and he tyrannized the people, forcing them, causing them to bow down and worship him, and to obey his laws and reject God's laws. And he persecuted the saints through through the Crusades and the Inquisitions. Wars, wars, and rumors of wars. Literally fought so many Crusades that Europe was bereft of of, uh, war-fighting men. But for the most part, generally speaking, Europe was left uh, a continent of widows and orphans and old men. Devastation that cannot even be comprehended in our day and age. And the papacy fulfilled that prophecy perfectly and completely. Now, the United States is referred to specifically as the second beast. And it rose up out of the wilderness, an unpopulated area of the world. It can only be the Western Hemisphere. And like you said, it has two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. How does a nation speak? By its laws. By its military power by its political and military power. What do two horns like a lamb represent? Well, obviously, Christ-like characteristics. It appears for all the world to be a Christian nation. Well, if it's a Christian nation, why does it speak like a dragon? Something's inconsistent. And I I think... uh, since Vatican Council II, and what a term is used so widely today, postmodernism, which literally means post Protestantism, since Vatican Council II was simply the, the concession of the Protestants in this country that the Pope is not the Antichrist. He's a Christian. And the world and, and the and the Christians of the United States ought to unite with him rather than to continue to denounce him as Antichrist. And of course this is going to be a repeat for most people, but the only reason the only reason 
Christians in this country capitulated to the papacy during Vatican Council II in the years following was because for three or four generations, Protestants were more and more and more convinced that the Antichrist was not the papacy, not the history of the popes from the first one to the current, but that the Antichrist was a single individual that comes at the end of time in a a disjointed 70th week of Daniel. And because they more and more and more believed in futurism, they more and more and more exonerated the papacy. Now, most people today don't even know what Protestantism means, and I, I recommend the listeners go to Wikipedia, of all places, and just type in Protestantism and find out what it says. And they'll discover what I've discovered. That Protestantism was built on the very foundation, the scriptural foundation. The descriptive words in the scriptures perfectly identify who the Antichrist is. It's the papacy. It's the only entity on the planet that even begins to fulfill all the prophecies, all the descriptive words in the Bible about the man of sin, the little horn, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible. In other words, it's a dead ringer, indisputable. And as a result of that, we reiterate that virtually every one of the Protestant reformers although they may have different, disagreed on, on some scriptural interpretation or some uh, biblical doctrine, they were united in this one thing without any dissent whatsoever. The one thing they all agreed on, it was the papacy that fulfilled all of the prophecies regarding the little horn of Daniel, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible. And that's how Protestantism got its name. It protested the Antichrist. And futurism, this idea that Antichrist is a single individual and doesn't uh, come on the world scene until sometime during a supposed seven-year period of time the world now calls the 70th week of Daniel, the papacy is exonerated. Let me just put it this way. If the Protestant reformers who have been dead for 500 years, if they knew that the United States government was going to host the Antichrist at a joint session of Congress this fall, they wouldn't turn in their graves. They would literally come out of their graves and stone us to death. And you say, Tom, that's very melodramatic. That's a little excessive. Aren't you just grandstanding, trying to draw attention to yourself? Well, I can tell the listeners that Yerk wouldn't say that. Neither would Walt Stickle. Neither would Mike Adams, because they understand the horror that is the papacy speaking to a joint session of Congress. They've read the scriptures for themselves that I've referenced. They've learned the history of Protestantism, what it really represents. They're one with me when I say the Protestant reformers wouldn't just turn in their graves. They would come out of their graves and stone us to death. And rightfully so. I know Jesus Christ because of the sacrifices made by the Protestant reformers. And I know who Antichrist is because of the sacrificial stand 
of the Protestant reformers. And I know what this country originally represented. It represented a government in its founding that not only knew who the Antichrist was, but made provision in the Constitution that that Antichrist, that Pope, could never control this country. And here he is coming to this country to address the highest legislative office in the land. Under a constitution that guarantees the Pope, the triple tyrant from Rome, the one who's guilty of the blood of the martyrs and the saints and all the slain of the earth, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist could never rule in this country like he ruled during the old world order. A constitution that guarantees freedom of religion, which Rome has never tolerated. A constitution that guarantees the right of freedom of conscience, in other words, freedom to read and worship God, uh, read the Bible and worship God according to the dictates of one's conscience as he reads the Bible, under the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit. Now, if the Holy Spirit is telling you that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of history, as our Protestant reformers so stridently taught, then we have the right to speak out against this Pope addressing a joint session of Congress. That same Constitution that guarantees us freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, also guarantees us the right of freedom of speech so that I can get on this broadcast, in a public broadcast, and speak my mind. Did you know that Pope Pius IX, the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church that was decreed divine and infallible at the First Vatican Council in 1870, denounced all, virtually all, of those Protestant liberties, those Protestant rights embodied in our Constitution, and damned them as pestilential her her heresy. Pestilential error. In the Roman Catholic Church, there is no freedom of conscience. You must believe the way the hierarchical church teaches. You may not read the Bible for yourself and let, allow the Bible to interpret itself. And you may not read it and interpret it yourself. You must obey the teachings. You must accept the teachings and obey the teachings of the priests of the Roman Catholic Church. No liberty of conscience, no liberty of religion. If you're not Roman Catholic, you were handed over to the Inquisition, you were interrogated, you must capitulate or suffer torture and death and burning at the stake. You were, either, you were either Roman Catholic or you died. Your property was confiscated. Your children were sent off to nunneries and, and monasteries and, or ado adopted out to Roman Catholic families. Completely wipe out the family. If you were a Protestant heretic in the old world order, if you protested the Antichrist, you were deemed a heretic. And the Fourth, Va the Fourth Lateran Council made it a meritorious work to kill a heretic. And Bible believers died by the millions. All their properties were confiscated, used to enrich the papacy. Can I make a little remark here, Tom? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but I think there's a statement made by John Wycliffe um, 
that is very interesting in this, uh, in this regard. And the statement is, the Bible is the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And doesn't it say that in the Constitution? Certainly does. Certainly does, John Wycliffe, the, the morning star of the Reformation. And there's All another quote. Uh, there's another quote going together with this, and that is from J. A. Wiley from his work *Rome and Civil Liberty*, where he states, "Quote: Doubt alone is lord of the conscience. That was the truth that set Europe free." End of quote. And we have to understand that when we go back to the roots of the United States of America, where do all the people come from that inhabit the United States of America today? They all came from Europe, because in Europe they were suppressed. We are speaking about the time from before the Reformation, from the so-called finding of, the United, uh, of America by Columbus, which of course we all know was a fraud until the Reformation took place in the, early 16, uh, in the early 16th century. All the people fled Europe because they could not worship God as they wanted, because as Tom already said, they were persecuted, they were tortured, they were burned alive, they were flayed, they were strangled, they were beheaded. Everything was done to them, everything was done to prevent the word of God to come among the people. And the people fled old Europe and went to the so-called New World, the now United States of America, first and for all. Because there was no freedom of conscience in Europe. And that, what the, that is what um, the Protestant Reformation has done for Europe. It had set the minds of the people free. And the people who still could not join that went to America and immigrated there. And I guess when you, uh, when you see where all the American people come from today, I mean about 50% alone have German roots when you trace that back, almost about 50%. And the rest came from good old England, Ireland, but also uh, the Netherlands, France, and some other countries where they were persecuted of their beliefs, and they thought they would find freedom in this new world where... The Bible is the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, as it was in the time of the colonies, first and for all. So, sorry to interrupt you, Hitler, but I hope it was an interesting point to make it somewhere. And I'd love you to go deeper into that if you like to. Yes, well, certainly. Certainly go deeper uh, as you please. But the point I was making, that this nation once recognized that government of by and for the people a people that were liberated by the Protestant Reformation, by the Word of God. And they put in place in our Constitution guarantees religious liberty, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech. Do you know that in the old world order when the Pope ruled supreme, the papacy controlled the government's of the earth. He seated and unseated the kings. He crowned and uncrowned the kings. If a king wouldn't behave or obey the pope, he'd simply lift his crown and give it to another. And if the king wasn't cooperative, he would send other nations to overthrow him. He ruled over the kings of the earth. Now, we didn't want that to be the case in this country. We didn't want a king or a pope. We wanted a duly elected president. We didn't want to follow the model of the old world order. It was designed from the very beginning to be a new thing on the earth. And we were guaranteed the right for the first time to criticize both the Pope and the King 
our president. But today, that's not the case. Because today, just like in the old world order, the church, the Roman Catholic Church, and the state are now united. And the state, that is the government, shares the sanctity of the papacy. So they are mutually, they are united, church and state, and now mutually sacrosanct. And if anyone speaks out against the government, they can be regarded by the government as a domestic terrorist, a potential threat. You see, they virtually restored the old world order in practice. And that's what the new world order is. Yerk, did you have a further comment? Um, yeah, in the beginning you stated about Revelation 13, verse 11, the land that has two horns. And I think there are a lot of people who don't understand that. They say, well, I look at a, at a land that doesn't have any horn. But meant by these two horns is the separation of church and state. And um, that is one vital point uh, in the United States of America. And now when the Pope comes over, the Antichrist, to speak at the joint session of Congress, that is, of course, emerging with church and state, so that the two horns will become one horn, like the little horn. I mean, when you study the history, uh, and you study the history of pagan Rome and the conversion into papal Rome that we have today, uh, the fourth piece of Daniel, Daniel said in his prophecy that this fourth piece will be diverse from all the other beasts before him. And what was that diversity? That diversity is the melting of church and state. And that's why the United States of America, in their foundation, or 13 colonies at least, there you have a complete um, differential point, and that is that you had church and state not combined together. And the Vatican does that. And to reach full power for this second beast coming out of the earth, it's probably is very vital that church and state will merge. And that took a very, very big step forward in, I think it was 2006, when George W. Bush introduced the 501c3 organizations. Now, when you're a Protestant out there in the United States and you visit your church, check out if your church is a 501c3 organization. And probably when you go to a any denomination there that is, has a little bit of a following, you will see that it will be a 501c3 organization. Now do the next step. Go to your computer and Google 501c3 implementations and ask yourself what does it imply that my congregation is a 501c3 organization. And you will find out that any church signing the contract of tax exemption under 501c3 code is nothing more than a government agency and that is melting church with state and that is in the constitution of course forbidden just to go over the constitution for 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 a second you know this is um, a very very important point and tom also made another very important point about the pope and how he and, of course, the whole papacy, the Roman Catholic system in total, always condemned the Bible and slew millions and even hundreds of millions of people just for possessing the Bible and want to read the Word of God. Now, you can say, oh, you're just making that up. So I'm going to quote from you from the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 12, page 496. What is the churches, the Roman Catholic Churches stand on the Bible. Quote, The supremacy of the Bible as source of faith is unhistorical, illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. It is unhistorical. End quote. Now, your country, the United States of America, is now... And my country is not any different here in Europe. We are so involved with the Vatican, I cannot believe it, but it's true. Now, the United States of America will be so involved in that that they also take that over. And 
That means that everyone who still protests will be seen as a terrorist. When you have the foundation of your belief in the Bible, you are a terrorist. And truth has become the new hate speech. Because nobody wants to hear the truth. Okay, Tom. Something to elaborate on there? Excellent points, everyone. I want to remind the listeners that the Vatican is only approximately 108 acres. The Pope is only one man. It's a city. It's a church and a city. It itself is a church and a state. It sets the, it sets the model for the old, the old world order, union of church and state. The Pope doesn't have his own navy. The Pope doesn't have his own marines. He doesn't have an army. He cannot defend himself. He cannot impose his will upon anyone. Let me repeat, the Vatican is only 108 acres. So how can the Pope impose his will on the nations? How can the Pope govern the world when he has no army, no military, no nothing? He must have the cooperation of the states, the governments of the world, or he cannot wield any power anywhere. And that's why it was absolutely necessary that the kings of Europe submit to the papacy. It's why it was absolutely necessary that if the Pope said, go to war against this or that nation, they dutifully clicked their heels, armed their militaries, and went on a crusade for the Pope, because the Pope simply cannot wage his own wars. It is absolutely vital to the, to the survival of the papacy that the kings of the earth do his bidding that the militaries of all the nations of the world do his bidding and fight his wars. Otherwise, he can do nothing. He is a nobody. He has no power but what man voluntarily gives him. Do you understand the papacy? could not exist today if no one obeyed him anymore. He would just go away. If the kings of the earth all at once recognized, as they did at the time of the Protestant Reformation, that the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible and simply quit obeying him, he would have absolutely no power on earth. But that's just too easy. There would be no bloodshed. There would be no killing. There would be no war. Only peace. You see, that's just how easy Jesus defeated Satan during his temptation. He just wouldn't obey Satan. And Satan had to walk away. How easy it would be. The world could be done with this Antichrist. No more wars. No more nation against nation, kindred against kindred. We would all learn the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Peace would reign all over this world. But the papacy foments these wars, keeps us all indebted to war, makes us all soldiers in his army, makes us all kill in the name of God. 
and none of us has the sense that God gave a soda cracker. None of us has the sense that God gave the Protestant reformers. They obeyed God's instruction. What was that? Simply this. Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. When they realized that the papacy was the Antichrist, they left the church in protest. Left the Pope alone. No one would obey him anymore. That's when the mortal wound was inflicted on the papacy. Everybody left the party. The Pope had nothing to do but the cleanup. You know, the Pope could have died of starvation. The papacy could have died of loneliness. When the triple tyrant of Rome had ruled all of Europe with a rod of iron, led crusade after crusade after crusade, inquisition after inquisition after inquisition, completely tyrannized all of Europe, and all of a sudden, at a word from the Bible that the papacy is the Antichrist, everybody fled, and all of a sudden, the Pope wasn't even worth the vestments that he wore. It's just how easy it would be to liberate the world today. A word. The papacy is the Antichrist. If the United States people recognize that the Pope is the Antichrist of the Bible, do you think the Pope would have the courage to set foot on our shores, much less address a joint session of Congress? If nobody obeyed the Pope anymore, who would fly him over here? If the whole world was restored with the knowledge that the Protestant reformers possessed, who would pilot the Pope's plane to come to this country? And if he somehow and if he somehow managed to to get to this country and address Congress, do you think any of them would call him your eminence or holy father? Do you think any of them would even show up? But the most powerful people in our government, Roman Catholics all, are heralding the arrival of their Pope in September to address the most powerful legislative body in this country. Church and state are now once again united, and history is about to repeat itself. Bloody history is about to repeat itself, and the American people don't have a clue what's about to hit them. Did you have a comment here? Yes, I had a little comment on that, because you made a very interesting point there when you said, well, the Vatican is only 108 acres big, and the Pope is just merely a man, but all the kings of the earth bow to them. A lot of people maybe ask themselves, how is that possible? Why do they do it? And the answer is very simple. Enter the Jesuits. The Jesuit order founded in 1540, a military arm of the Vatican, as stated by Napoleon. And we can go deeper into that if you want later on. But because the Jesuits are the masters of infiltration and subversion, and they infiltrated and subverted every other independent, so-called independent government in the world, that is why the papacy has that power. And you have to make one thing in history very sure you know. In 1773, the Jesuit order was banned forever by a papal bull. And 25 years later, in 1798, General Berthier, under the command of Napoleon, went into the Vatican and, take, and took the Pope captive. 
where he died a year after in captivity. And the temporal power was taken away from the Pope at that time. At that time, the Pope had not the power that he used to have on all the peoples of the world before. But the problem is that in 1776, you had the founding of the Illuminati by a Jesuit professor at Jesuit University in Ingolstadt, Bavaria. And the founding of the Illuminati was nothing else than another front organization to take over the work of the Jesuits that they could not do openly anymore after they had been banned in 1773. And through the working of the Illuminati in between the years of 1798, where the Pope got captive, and 1814, where the Jesuits were reinstalled, that is actually when the wound started healing again. And that explains another verse of the Bible about the beast that is, not is, and yet is. Because it was actually stroke with the sword in 1798 and came back to life in 1814 through the working of the Jesuits. And of course later on in 1929 with the lateral treaty that Mussolini signed with the, uh, with the Vatican and gave him back um, the civil power or the temporal power. Those are the two keys represented in the Vatican flag, temporal and spiritual power. So when you ask yourself, how can this one man have all this power? This one man doesn't have the power. He has to have an army that is behind him. And that army was founded by Ignatius of Loyola, 1534, and acknowledged by the Pope in 1540. And that is a military organization. And for that, you can uh, read what um, Napoleon said in his, uh, uh, in his biography. He wrote about the Jesuits a very important statement. And when I find it here, then I will read that to you. Uh, just a little bit looking. I have it here. Uh, quote, the Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power power in its most despotic exercise, absolute power, universal power, and though Catholic also means universal, power to control the world by the, violin, by the volition of a single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms, and at the same time the greatest and most enormous of abuses." End quote. We have done a lot of broadcasts where we dealt with the Jesuits. And as long as you do not understand the Jesuits, you do not understand the power of the Pope over all the people of the world. Because as Tom rightfully said, the Pope wouldn't have any power if men wouldn't obey him. And why do they obey him? Because they have been infiltrated and the, um, the governments have been subversed. That's all that I want to say for that uh, at the moment. I think you have really uh, you have probably something to add that, Tom. Certainly, the Jesuits were created for the purpose of countering the Protestant Reformation. They had to convince the governments and the peoples of the world that the Pope is not the Antichrist, that it's someone else, anybody else. It's just not the papacy. So the Jesuits went to work to foment or to create a, 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 an alternative interpretation of the prophecies that would shed the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy onto someone else. We had two schools of prophetic thought that evolved from the, from the machinations of the Jesuits. The first was preterism, that somehow the Antichrist of the Bible was one of the, the Roman Caesars, Nero or Caligula and that he's long since gone, and now the papacy's job is to bring about in the world a Christ, a global Christian society. And that's the model that the papacy has used from then on. The alternative interpretation of Bible prophecy was called futurism. Again, the Pope is not the Antichrist, the papacy is not the Antichrist, but the, 
But the Antichrist is a single individual that comes on the world scene in a phony counterfeit refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Seven years of great tribulation, they call it. When the Antichrist, the quote-unquote Antichrist, signs a peace treaty with the Jews, and after three and a half years, he causes the sacrifices and the oblations to cease. Okay? That's what the whole world is prepared to see. The papacy has been exonerated because the papacy, through the Jesuits, has effectively shed the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy, and people either believe that the Antichrist was Caligula or Nero or even more ridiculously Alexander the Great of the Grecian Empire, the Greek Empire. They now believe in a future Antichrist. And what characterized the Protestant Reformation was the, was the unanimous recognition that the papacy and only the papacy could be the Antichrist. And so how were the Jesuits going to counter, ref, uh, counter the Reformation? How were they going to effectively propagate these beliefs among the nations and the peoples of the world? Well, first they had to ingratiate themselves to the governments of the nations of the world. And they infiltrated, and what they literally became were the confessors of kings. Those who believe that they must confess their sins to a priest chose a Jesuit. Why? Well, because the Jesuits would give them very easy penances to do and would absolve them of their sins. And not only that, the Jesuits were the premier educators of their day. And they would be invited to the nations of the world to set up schools for the children, colleges and universities for the young men and women, and bring affluence and wealth and strength to the nation's children. How best to ingratiate yourself to a man that you wish to destroy? simply pat his child on the head. You're an instant friend. That's what the Jesuits did. Came into a country, said, we will be your confessors. We will give you absolution. We will educate your children, make you one of the strongest nations on the planet. And not only that, the Jesuits were excellent in trade. Establishing trade routes, establishing exchanges of goods from one nation to another, and thereby steering the foreign policies of every nation. That's how they infiltrated the nations of the world. That's how they became so powerful, and that's how they shed the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy and onto anybody but the papacy. That's how you destroy the Counter-Reformation. From the Jesuits, we got preterism, we got futurism. Both together work to exonerate the papacy. And now he's viewed as the vicar of Christ. And that all the Protestant reformers were wrong. Europe should never have been liberated from the tyranny of the Pope. Church and state should have been always maintained. And that's exactly what Rome intends to do in this country. With futurism came ecumenism. Because everybody agreed, all the Protestants agreed, the, Pope, the Protestant Reformation was wrong, the Pope is not the Antichrist, as the Protestant Reformers said. The Pope simply demands now that the union of church and state be restored, the Pope's temporal crown be restored. He becomes the civil and the spiritual leader of the world. That's precisely what's happening in the United States today. Church and state are being united, just as it was in the old world order. Listen, I I want to coin a phrase. I want people to comprehend what we're saying. The new world order 
is simply the old world order restored. There's nothing new at all about the new world order. All you have to do is examine the old world order, and you know what the new world order is. And when church and state were united in the old world order and the triple tyrant from Rome ruled over the kings of the earth and killed the Bible believers, persecuted them, the same will be done in the new world order. Church and state are now being united and religious persecution, government-sponsored religious persecution, global inquisition is about to be restored. And if you think the Pope of Rome is coming to speak to a joint session of Congress, isn't going to carry with it that very significance that I've just outlined for you, then you are in denial. Ignorance is not bliss in this case. Ignorance of the Bible and ignorance of history are not bliss in this case. They never have been. Pardon, Yerk? They never have been. Ignorance has never been a bliss. No. Because for the bad man to succeed, all that needs to be happening is for the good man to do nothing. So when the good man is ignorant to the doings of the bad man, then of course you will have a bad man rule. All throughout the history, that is. I just want to add something else here, which is a quote from Civilta Catholica, that is the house organ of the Jesuits. And I'm doing this quote because a lot of people refer to what happened in in the United States, uh, certainly since the time of the Patriot Act. They see that the United States of America is turning into what some people call the Fourth Reich and saying, well, that's the continuation of the Third Reich and what happened in Germany that can never happen here, they say. But when you know that the United States of America is run by Jesuits through Georgetown University, where all the legislative is being made, not only in Congress, but in that university, for example, um, the Patriot Act was written by a Vietnamese Ding, I think was his name, uh, who wrote the Patriot Act in Georgetown University. That Jesuit university gives you all uh, uh, all the reason where, where, the, where, the, uh, where the laws of the United States are made. So there was this one quote that I have to, oh, now I have to look it up here again, I, I, I lost it, <laughs> um, from, the, uh, from the Jesuit um, paper there. I just lost You're it. You're absolutely right. Viet Din is the author of the Patriot Act. Georgetown, Jesuit Georgetown University produced the Patriot Act. It was actually already legislated, all it lacked was printing. It was ready to go for printing right after 9-11. That document, the Patriot Act, would have taken years and years and years with teams and teams and teams of lawyers pouring over the laws of that document. It's a voluminous work. It took Georgetown University a tremendous effort to produce that document, yet it was ready to go before 9-11. Yeah. Viet Dinh, Viet Din, assist, the assistant attorney general to John Ashcroft, Viet Dinh was a native Vietnamese. He was a cousin of the Roman Catholic dictatorship under No Dinh Diem during the Kennedy administration. It was No Dinh Diem that was put in power by the CIA and Cardinal Spellman and the Roman Catholic Church to tyrannize Buddhist Vietnam to make Vietnam Roman Catholic and then from Vietnam to launch Catholicism all over Southeast Asia. Viet Viet Dinh is a cousin of that no Dinh Dien or that Viet Dinh government, that Roman Catholic dictatorship of Vietnam. He was a refugee from Vietnam. He came to this country, was put through a Jesuit education, 
and shuffled right on up to the assistant to the attorney general of this country. And he remains to this day an adjunct professor of Jesuit Georgetown University. The Patriot Act is a Roman Catholic document, and it was brought to power after 9/11, which was an inside job. And we're going to talk about we're going to talk more about 9/11 when we start talking specifically about the current pope, a Jesuit pope, the first Jesuit pope in history, and how he factors in all of this 9/11 and everything else. What you're going to find out in the next few moments in this program is that the United States Congress is about to host one of the greatest murderers in world history. Jorge Bergoglio, Pope Francis I, a diabolical creation of the Jesuit order, one of the most bloodthirsty killers in history, and with very, very close ties to the Nazi regime of Adolf Hitler and the Bush family. And with that, I'm going to take a five-minute break. I'll come right back. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Tom, for that uh, important deliberation. In the meantime, I have found back the quote that I was looking for from the Civilta Catholica, which is the house organ of the Jesuits. And that explains how many people are seeing the United States of America turning from, uh, well, democracy, which it never was actually because it was a republic anyway, turning into a fascist regime. And that quote is very, very interesting to read. So, quote, fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome, end quote. So when you not only understand this quote, but also understand that your laws, as Tom just so very explicitly explained, are written through Georgetown University, which is a Jesuit university, then you know how it, why it comes that America turns into a fascist country. Because the Church of Rome rules the United States of America. Um, there's not much more that I have to say to that point, but uh, when, we, when, when Tom comes back to this uh, conversation, um, I want already to, to read to you a statement um, that was done by uh, Nancy Pelosi, who is a Democratic leader, and made a statement on the visits of uh, Pope Francis coming to the United States. Walt, um, do you have some comments on the things that we have been talking up to now? Well, when you mentioned the Third Reich, I mean, uh, the Fourth Reich is controlled by the same people that control the Third Reich. That's right. In, uh, in other words, uh, you know, the Third Reich came out of Bavaria. And uh, Bavaria was never Protestant. The Protestant Reformation never reached Bavaria. And it was, in other words, compare it to Spain. And that is where Himmler came from. That's where, that's where the, the Nationalist Socialist Party came from. And so, you know, and it's the same people that are running the Third Reich that are, you know, it was the Jesuits. You know, the Jesuits wrote my calf and run that whole show, that whole theater of war. <clears throat> yeah, it was the Jesuit father Stempfler who wrote Mein Kampf for Hitler. Yes, yes. Oh. No. Okay, is Tom Beck already? Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't think so. He's, 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 he's not... Uh... Oh, that, that's all right. You have something else to elaborate on on the stuff that we were talking about in this first hour of the broadcast? Well, it kind of takes your breath away. Tom is covering it step by step, and you notice that Tom is, you can tell by his voice. I mean, this is, this is a historical event, you know, especially... It is, it is we're seeing by the prophecy fulfilled before our eyes. That is absolutely I, an historical event, yeah. 
right before our eyes in the fact that, you know, the Bible is so clear. The Bible is being so clear, like when, you know, the whole world, where the whole world is deceived. They cannot see this. You know, and I, 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 um, I, 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 I'm just kind of getting ready to, uh, you know, this book is up on the Internet real readily to read, but uh, The Papacy is the Antichrist by J.A. Wiley. And what Tom mentioned, yes, can you imagine J.A. Wiley, you know, realizing that the Pope was going to come to speak to our to the joint session of Congress? You know, it's, it's, uh, and it, 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 you know, I, I just, it, you know, it, it, uh, it, it, this is this 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 makes all of your research, you see. I mean, everything we've we've researched, it comes to a head. There's no there's no speculation, and what's going on. Yeah, nobody can talk of a conspiracy theory on that subject. No, no. I mean, the Pope is going to speak on September 24th, okay, and he's going to be lauded. He's going to be he's going to be applauded. And he's going to speak on global warming and the economy and 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 on the on the alternative lifestyle in the, in the, in the sodomite issue, you know, and, and, the, and the liberals, I've already can tell by sharing a little bit of, in the secular world. I mean, I mean, they they think this Pope is, this Pope is a different Pope. He's saying, I, I like what I've even had people say this to me. I like what this Pope's saying. And that just shows you what Tom talked about is that people do not know the definition of a protestant. You know, uh, no, that's right. And if they want to know what the Protestant really is and how the Protestant word came into existence in fighting the Roman Catholic system, they would uh, they should look up and Google the Concile of Speyer of 1529. Yeah. Because that's when the word Protestant for the first time appeared. And when Tom's and when Tom says this, I remember at first I, he would, he, uh, you know, when he would say this. If you want to understand this new world order, you have to understand the old world order. And it's exactly what's going on. It's, ex- it's I mean, it's a, it's a carbon copy. Can you imagine that the President of the United States from at speaking at a, at, a, at a prayer meeting there in Washington, D.C., and, 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 and um, persecutes, he... Uh, how's the word I want to say? He's negative. He, he mentions, he brings up the Inquisition and that, the, you know, religion, uh, even, even, even Christians, you know, were evil. He brings it up in that, in that frame of mind. But, but look at the Inquisition. Who are they killing? They literally have turned the tables because they were killing the Christians. The Christians had nothing to do with the Inquisition. Are the Crusades? That was wrong, you know. Yeah, but that's not what you get out of the speech of Obama, right? No, no. He, well, they, well, 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 he, blames, actually, he blames the Crusades on the Christians, and many yes. millions of people have been killed in the name of God. Yeah, but what God? Yeah, yeah. In other words, Christian God of the Bible. <laughs> it, it, and, and you know, this 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 first hour, I may sit here and listen. It just takes my breath away. I'm telling you, because it's it's right out in front of us. It's right out in front of us. And, you know, um, this is a quote, uh, this is a preface of uh, of, uh, A.J. Wiley. You know, he said, you know, we conclude, therefore, that if Jesus of Nazareth be the Christ, the Roman papacy is the Antichrist. It's just, it's, it's, in other words, it's just as prevalent to know Jesus Christ. I mean, there's more... Evidence, the evidence that Christ, what is there, how many prophecies, uh, it prophesied when Christ was going to come, it prophesied what city he was going to be born in. You know, it, in other words, it, it's, it's no secret. Jesus is no secret. This is a historical fact, whether a person's in the secular world, of course the secular world right now is trying to say that Jesus never, it, it, it never, you know, it was all myth. But, but you know, this 
the history, the history proves that Christ existed. And, and history proves who the Antichrist is. It's not even any anymore. I have to learn some patience now. Or, you know, and I have. It's humbled me. Because when I get in front of somebody now and, you know, they don't know who the Antichrist is, they haven't read their Bible. In, in, in other words, it's right. I mean, and I have some friends, you know, but but I know they just haven't had, I just, I, I understand they just haven't the information that has been taken out of them and they don't understand when you, a man like J.A. Wiley and Henry Gratton Guinness and Spurgeon, you know, I mean, we, we've forsaken these men. We've turned our backs on, on, on what give us the Bible. Well, worse than that, yeah, anybody, anybody who says that the papacy is not the Antichrist literally profanes every drop of Protestant blood that has been shed by the papacy through 605 consecutive years of Holy Roman Inquisitions against those who read God's word and understood it and understood that the papacy was the Antichrist from that Bible. Anybody who says the Pope is not the Antichrist, anybody who says the Pope ought to address a joint session of Congress has just spit in the faces of the hundreds of millions of peoples who died in this world, Bible-believing Christians, who went to their death proclaiming that the papacy was the Antichrist. That's why it's so important for the papacy to take the Bible out of the equation and to take God out of our lives, as we have uh, done into when we were reading, uh, when we did the show on the externalization of the hierarchy. But um, I want to get back to the point why we are making this broadcast tonight, and this broadcast was uh, for... Uh, waking the people up of the importance of the Pope's visit to the United States of America this year, uh, later on in September. And I want to start reading a quote. Uh, Tom, I just gave you the link here in Skype that you can uh, read it for yourself. I want to read it out loud once, the statement that Nancy Pelosi did on a Pope Francis addressing a joint meeting of Congress. And then after I've read it, I want you to uh, examine this reading together with me and see where are where is the deception in this little article. So this is a press release that was released on the 5th of February 2015 by Nancy Pelosi, a Democratic leader. And it reads as follows, quote, Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi today released the following statement after Speaker Berner announced His Holiness Pope Francis has accepted an invitation to address a joint meeting of Congress on September 24 during his visit to the United States. Quote, We are honored and overjoyed that Pope Francis, the first pontiff born in the Americas, has accepted our invitation to address a joint meeting of Congress during his upcoming visit to the United States. Pope Francis has renewed the faith of Catholics worldwide and inspired a new generation of people, regardless of their religious affiliation, to be instruments of peace. In the spirit of the namesake of San Francisco, St. Francis of Assisi, Pope Francis's universal message of love and compassion speaks to millions around the world. We are eager to welcome His Holiness to the U.S. Capitol, and we look forward to hearing His call to life our values, to protect the poor and the needy, and to promote peace. End quote. This is just breathtaking when you take the moment to really read the words that are stated here by Nancy Pelosi who, of course, is a Roman Catholic, as we all know. When she says, inspired a new generation of people, regardless of their religious affiliation, to be instruments of peace, what does that make everybody who is not 
part of the so-called inspired new generation, regardless of their religious affliction. That means that when you don't make part of the Roman Catholic belief system, you are against peace. And that means you are a terrorist. There's much more to be analyzed in this text, I think. Uh, Tom will probably give us a little bit deeper explanation. But this was, for me, the most important point that I took out of this, and I wanted just to make that. So, please, Tom. Oh, it's a, bra- it's, a, it's a brazen lie. It, it is abject deception. There's no way in the world anyone of a sound mind who knows anything about the history of the Jesuits which this Pope represents, he is first and foremost a Jesuit, is to say that he is a harbinger of peace. I alluded earlier to the fact that the Jesuits became the confessors of the kings and queens of the world. They ingratiated themselves to the leadership of every country and became their confessors. Now, what goes on in a confessional box between a king of a country and a Jesuit priest? The Jesuit priest is in the confidence of that king or queen of that nation. And they are, they are pressured to confess all, to make a good confession. And so the Jesuits can pose questions to the most powerful people in the world. What is their foreign policy regarding this or that nation? and thereby learn the most intimate secrets of every nation's government. And with that information, the Jesuits can foment wars between nations and states that were previously at peace. The wars of the world are instigated by the Jesuits, who are the confessors, the most confidential confessors of the most powerful kings and queens and potentates in the world. And they use the information that they gather through the confessional box to foment wars. And each one of those wars is designed by the Jesuits to better and to strengthen their position as the governors of all the governments of the world. The Jesuits can literally hold any government hostage with the information that they collect from the collection, the, the, the confessional box of the kings of the earth. The Jesuits are privy to the most consequential information available in the world today from all the governments of the world. They can incite wars. They can create disturbances in places that will draw attention from certain nations at certain times to achieve the Jesuit purpose. And the Jesuit purpose is to, number one, destroy Protestantism wherever it exists, destroy the common knowledge of the Protestant Reformation that the Pope is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. And once that Protestant voice is finally silenced than to restore the papacy to his global kingdom status, his global sovereign status as king of kings and lord of lords. And they're very effective at doing so. Anyone who is even mildly familiar with the history of the Jesuits knows who foments all the world of the wars of the world and for Nancy Pelosi to equate peace with a Jesuit Pope or any Pope for that matter, whether he's Jesuit or not, is insanity. It's abject deception. And this Pope, no more no less than any Pope in history, is a fomenter of war. And his war was called the Dirty War from Argentina. Argentina had begun to embrace Marxism, defined by the Roman Catholic Church as godless. And this pope 
Jorge Bergoglio was the Jesuit provincial of all of Argentina, arguably the most important man in all of Argentina. And he helped establish the military, the the Nazi-style military junta or government of Argentina. And they overthrew the legitimately elected government of Argentina. This military junta was put in place by the CIA and the Vatican to overthrow, quote-unquote, godless communism, godless Marxism in Argentina. And through the lead, the lead and influence of Jorge Bergoglio, Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio, this military junta went on an inquisition, a literal, historical-style inquisition, and interrogated anybody that they might have suspected of being supportive of this Marxist government that was legally established in Argentina. And anybody that they found to be an enemy of this Nazi regime put in place by the United States and the Bush family and the Vatican were simply rounded up and disappeared. They they literally, during this dirty war, coined the term disappeared. And what that amounts to is when they found somebody that was sympathetic to the Marxist regime, they would interrogate them, torture them in in virtually the same manner that they that they tortured Protestants uh throughout all papal history. <clears throat> but then when they finally got what they thought was all the information available, they simply loaded them all up on helicopters flew them out over the Atlantic Ocean, and from 500, 1,000, several thousand feet, just kicked them out. Weighted them down with weight so they would never float back to shore. And people by the thousands were just disappearing. Children were disappearing. They would literally kidnap children right from their mother's arms and then take this sympathetic, this Marxist mother, interrogate her and torture her and then load her up on a helicopter, fly her out over the Atlantic and drop her out. And they would cop, they would kidnap the child, put him through uh, the nunneries. And many times the children were killed. They simply didn't know what else to do with them but to kill them. And it was all overseen by this pope, this Jesuit pope, Jorge Bergoglio, Francis I, who I maintain is not the namesake of the so-called Saint Francis of Assisi. He takes his name from Francis Xavier, the co-partner, co-founder of the Jesuit order with Ignatius Loyola. He is an inquisitor. He is a bloodthirsty killer. He has on his belt the notches of 45,000 Argentinians. Those who just simply wanted to elect their own government. And he's being invited by the Roman Catholics of our country to come and speak and address our Congress. I tell you what, our government is so corrupt, it would take a month to describe just what I know about it. And I'm only one. The Bush family is closely linked to this pope. Prescott Bush, the father of the first Bush president, George H.W. Bush, his name was Prescott Bush, and he was a banker. He ran the Union Banking Corporation, which was discovered by our own Congress as nothing but a money laundering operation for the Nazi regime during World War II, leading up to the war. 
the Bush family, Prescott Bush, was literally financing the Nazi regime of Adolf Hitler. And they were brought into question by the Congress under the Trading with the Enemies Act. And they were forced to close their, their business, their bank. That didn't stop them from financing the Nazis. Prescott Bush was not tried for high trees and high crimes and misdemeanors. He was never, never punished for that. And George H.W. Bush, the son of Prescott Bush, became the head of the CIA. And it was through that very same CIA during the Second World War, together with the Vatican, opened up the Vatican rat lines and literally, after the war, hustled out all the most valuable Nazi assets into Argentina. Where Jorge Bergoglio would eventually be the Jesuit superior, the Jesuit provincial, who helped cover up the Nazis in, in Argentina who helped protect the reputation of the Roman Catholic Church and the CIA in their joint effort, after having financed the Nazi regime, then to hustle out all their most important little Catholic soldiers from Germany and bring them down to safe haven in Argentina. The link between the Bush family, the CIA, the Vatican, and Jorge Bergoglio when it becomes apparent in your mind, you'll know darn well why they made him Pope. And I want to recommend people, if you want to see the history of this Pope, Jorge Bergoglio, the so-called Francis I, Francis of Assisi, the great, you know, uh, Francis of Assisi, the most the most lovable of all the Roman Catholic saints, he's not named after him at all. He's named after Francis Xavier, the co-founder of the Jesuit order. He's a bloodthirsty killer, and he's a member of the most bloodthirsty organization on the planet, the Jesuit order. And if you want to know what this pope really represents, if you want to see his crimes for yourself, just go to YouTube videos and download and watch the video entitled, Pope Francis, What the Media Has Hidden from You. Pope Francis, What the Media Has Hidden from You. It's a two-part series. It's over two hours, <clears throat> two hours of information, documentation, mainstream media documentations of the history of the crimes of this pope. Watch those two videos. Pope Francis, what the media has hidden from you. And for Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner to herald this pope as a harbinger of peace is insanity. It's a diabolical lie. Pope Francis, when he was Jesuit superior the, the supreme, most powerful man in Argentina helped install that Nazi regime that overthrew the legitimate government, and then he opened up an inquisition. That's exactly what he's going to do in this country. Oh, he won't admit that when the cameras are all on him, and when all of the, the president and his cabinet, the Supreme Court, and all the governors, all the all all, all the, the senators and congressmen are lauding him as a harbinger of peace and a charitable man. What you're going to see before you is a bloodthirsty killer, and there's no other conclusion that can be drawn from the facts surrounding Jorge Bergoglio. Our government is betraying us like nobody's business. This is a 
supreme example of deceit by our own government. Our government is waging war against the citizenry of this country, and the closer you are to Christ, the closer you are to his gospel, the closer you are to understanding the Bible, the more threat you appear to them. Jorge Bergoglio is an inquisitor of the purest kind, a textbook example of the Inquisitions. And he is dead set bent on changing this pro- this once Protestant land into a Roman Catholic crusader. And we fought the crusades all over this world. We have advanced the papal and the Jesuit cause for almost the entire the entirety of the history of this nation. We don't fight wars to protect the sovereignty of this nation. We don't fight wars to preserve the liberties of the people of this country. We fight wars to advance the Jesuit and the papal cause. Jesuit fomented wars. CIA, Jesuit Knights of Malta fomented wars. Did you know Prescott Bush was a, a Knight of Malta? Did you know George H.W. Bush was a Knight of Malta? Do you really understand what it is to be a skull and bonesman? That's what George W. Bush was, a skull and bonesman. They're dead set bent on destroying this Protestant republic, imposing tyranny on the people. You know what your Bible says? Does your Bible make any any difference to you? Is it important to you to know what God said? God said when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as labor pains. You know what else the Bible says? The Bible says peace, peace, when there is no peace. The Bible also says there will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. Well, let me tell you, this Jesuit Pope is no Jesus Christ. He's no Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of War. He is the Prince of Inquisition. He is a Prince of the Son of Perdition. And the American people are being sold a bill of goods that wouldn't convince a three-year-old that knew the truth. Nancy Pelosi, John Boehner, you call this diabolical man, Holy Father, is blasphemy of blasphemies. But then you come from the church of blasphemy. All popes are called Holy Father, aren't they? All popes are called your eminence. All popes are believed to be the representative, the very Jesus Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. You all belong to the church outside of which there is no salvation, according to your teaching. And what I see when I look at your church are triple tyrants all throughout history. And what I see when I look at your popes is the little horn of Daniel, the son of perdition, the man of sin, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist. Paul foresaw him. The apostle John foresaw him. The Waldenses foresaw him. They withstood him to his face, and they paid with their lives. The Albigensians, the same, the Huguenots, the Hussites, the Lawlers, the Protestants, the Anabaptists, the Jews, everybody recognized the Pope as the Antichrist. The United States, the land of Protestantism, doesn't recognize the Pope as the Antichrist. Somebody kicked me. You can't make up a horror like this.
Are you aware not only of the criminality of this Pope, but are you aware also that he is the supreme pedophile protector of the world? He is responsible to bring justice to the victims of hordes and scores and thousands and perhaps millions of pedophile priests around the world. They protect these priests and they victimize their victims. They deny, deny, deny. They take a a pedophile priest, protect him from the civil power, send him to a cushy little reform center run by the Roman Catholic Church and then put him right back in another diocese to sin again. Does any of you have a child that's been molested by a Roman Catholic priest? Are you going to believe Nancy Pelosi when he says, when she says that this Pope is a harbinger of peace, a man of peace and charity? Unbelievable what Americans will swallow when they've been so deluded by futurism, how they've forgotten their Protestant history, how they've forgotten the history of the papacy, and they think it has changed. That is, it it has reformed. It has now become a Christian church. How pathetic. Can you imagine Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father and looking down at the so-called Christians of this country and their ignorance and ready to hail the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist as Holy Father at a joint session of their Congress. Do you think he's going to remain seated on that throne when he sees such an outrage to his own name? when he sees Protestants who have lived under the the liberties provided by the bloodshed of Protestant liberators 500 years ago, how thankless they must appear to him. If there were any Protestantism left in this country, There would be war by morning if a leader of this country said the Pope was coming to visit. But there's no Protestantism left. Why? Because you all believe in a future Antichrist. You exonerated the papacy. You are ignorant of the most defining institution in all of world's history. All of history is marked by the bloodshed of the popes and the priests of the Roman Catholic Church. All of those that went before us, all Bible believers, lived day by day under the tyranny of the popes, knowing that any day now, they could become subject to the Inquisition, interrogated and tortured, and killed and burned at the stake. She think nothing of them to allow a Roman Catholic Congress to invite the man of sin to the very halls of your government? Why don't you just spit in Christ's face? Why don't you just curse him and die? You cannot profess Jesus Christ with your mouth and serve Antichrist with your hands and your feet. The ecumenical movement, which was successful only for one thing, that the Christians of this country 
renounce their historicism, renounce their Protestantism, stuff their Bibles in a dusty old corner, and then believe their Jesuit-trained pastors who said the Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years. Because of that abomination called futurism, the Pope is now regarded as a man of peace. The Pope is now regarded even by Protestants as the vicar of Christ. And he has a divine right to rule this world, both over spiritual things and temporal things, that he has a right to control the government of this land. King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what you got from futurism. That's what your ecumenism has brought you. You have literally renounced Jesus Christ. And now the land, the, this nation, is going to be soaked with the blood of God's people because of you bringing the man of sin, the grand inquisitor of all history, you have brought him to this land and subjected me to his horrors. You have literally put my life in jeopardy because I'll never shut up about this. I'll never agree with you that the Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years of time. And so you will regard me as a hater, as an anti-Roman Catholic bigot, as a divider rather than a uniter. You'll spend the rest of your days demonizing me for trying to tell you the truth. Demonizing me so that when they finally come for me, when the inquisitors finally come for me in their black jack-booted uniforms and automatic weapons, riot gear, and haul me off to prison, you'll think they're doing God's service. The American Christian is woefully deceived. Woefully deceived. Whoa, whoa, whoa on Christianity in the United States of America. You can't get any more deceived than to call the Pope Holy Father. You can't get any more deceived than to invite a world-class killer to a joint session of Congress and hail him as a man of peace. You can't get any more deceived than that. You can't get any more deceived than to welcome the world's pedophile priest protector and call him Holy Father, your eminence. And what would you say to our government? How would you have them govern our land? When I contemplate the horrors that are going to befall this country for this abject repudiation of Christ, for this grand apostasy, this grand delusion that is unfolding before our very eyes, I'm afraid to tell you that if Antichrist doesn't kill us, I fear Christ might. Is it starting to sink in? Do you, like many, just think I'm a lunatic, an anti-Roman Catholic bigot? Somebody trying to make a name for myself? Someone who's got a, uh, a martyr complex? I came to these truths kicking and screaming. I had no idea where God was going to take me. I had no idea what I was going to finally discover. But now that I know what I know, I can't shut up about this till God takes my last breath. My country's at stake. 
We're headed for a global tyranny, a global religion that absolutely excludes the Bible and Jesus Christ and replaces him with the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel, the once and for always Antichrist of the Bible. The papacy is the Antichrist. James A. Wiley was absolutely correct. The Waldenses were absolutely correct. The Albigenses were absolutely correct. The Aryan nations, the three kings that were uprooted by the papacy, at the very beginning of the papacy, they were correct. The Hussites were correct. The Wycliffeites were correct. The Hus, the 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 uh, Alba, the uh, uh, Huguenots were right. The Anabaptists were right. John Calvin was right. Martin Luther was right. Tyndale was right. Latimer and Cranmer and Ridley were right. They were all right. And so were the hundreds of millions of slain who went to the stake singing psalms of praise to the Christ. And proving with their own blood, their own sacrifice, who the Antichrist was. The, mo- mo- the most momentous times of all history have been repudiated. Every drop of plot Protestant blood has been repudiated by this godless, ignorant, biblically illiterate society. And there's no redemption for us but to get down on our faces in sackcloth and ashes, confessing our sins and then resisting this Antichrist that we have so blasphemously made alliance. And to rout the Catholics out of this government forever. Rout every Jesuit out of this land Take down all the Roman Catholic images and idols. Raise every Roman Catholic church to the ground. That's what it's going to take to appease the wrath of Almighty God. You know, the European Union, a virtual Roman Catholic superstate, Anybody that lives in Europe that knows anything about the formation of this this power called the European Union knows the Vatican is the very foundation of it, that the Antichrist is the very foundation of it. This European Union did just exactly what our Congress is doing. They invited the man of sin to come and speak at the at the European Parliament. John Paul II was back in the eighties. John Paul II came, and when he was behind the podium speaking, one man of God stood up. Ian Paisley, a Protestant Irishman, a prime minister, a prime minister, a distinguished member of that house, stood up at the back of the room and said, Antichrist! 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 And they hauled him off to prison instead of the Pope. Do you think there might there might be at least one of the senators or congressmen who would have the godly courage to stand up in the back of that hall and point at Harlow? Jorge Bergoglio, and say, Antichrist! 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 The 
it'll never happen. Not but by the grace of Almighty God. No, they will all in unison hail him as Holy Father. And they will bring the wrath of Almighty God to this entire nation. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. On your last point that you made, if you think that there will anybody stand up and call the Pope out for the Antichrist that he is, I do agree that will probably not happen. But when I remember right, and I made a video on that, I think that was last year, we have this house stenographer, Diane Reedy. Whether this was a faked one or it was not a faked one, Anyway, she said loud into the microphone, God will not be mocked. America was founded by Freemasons, and you cannot serve two masters. But that was, of course, not during a session, but afterwards. And today, I'm not sure anymore if that was faked or not, but she also was taken into a mental institution right afterwards. I haven't followed that up anymore because I think it was a faked or a staged event. Um, but... I think, together with you, an agreement that there will be nobody standing up at that joint session and call the Pope out for what he is. That is how deep the infiltration of the Jesuits have gone already, without the people noticing. They are blind to the things happening right before their eyes. The problem is, if you do not know the truth, then you have no chance to uncover a lie. And the truth is to be found in the Word of God, in the Scriptures, as it was preserved to us in the English-speaking uh, English-speaking uh, world in the King James Version. But people don't read that anymore. All they read is fantasy novels and all kinds of books, watch television, watch Hollywood movies, and are being caught up in this lying matrix of a controlled world where the news that is brought out has nothing to do with news or nothing to do with truth anyway. And they don't see that. And that's why uh, they caught sleeping. Tom, I thank you very much for your elaboration of not only this Nancy Pelosi statement article, but on your whole explanation about the importance of us to see what this coming of the Antichrist to the United States of America in the end of 2015 really will mean. And we will continue this uh, subjects in future broadcasts, probably. But for the moment, of course, uh, certainly uh, taking into consideration your voice, uh, we will end this broadcast here. I thank you very much to being on this call. I just want to ask Walt, Walt, do you have any closing comments before we close this program? Yes, one thing. You know, as I look at this, if there was any reaction going to be caused in the, in the United States, it would be a group of Catholics. So any Catholic that comes across this tape, don't think this is anti-Catholic because it was every single one of the reformers were Catholic. And, uh, and they have duped the American people, the American Catholic just as bad as they have the Protestant. And it would take, if anything was going to be, is going to happen in this country, it would be a group of good Catholics. You know, Catholics that understood what the, their hierarchy. It's not the people on the streets that we're pointing this to. This is the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church we're talking about the biblical, historical, prophetic Antichrist. One other thing that I want to say, <clears throat> every American should hear this message. 
But we know that we have a controlled media. So anybody listening to this, download it and share it with as many people as possible. God bless, and that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you, Walt. Tom, do you have a closing remark before we close up? I'll close the way I always do to restore Protestant knowledge. You have to understand what I'm about to say. Blessings in the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The 70th week of Daniel is over. Don't look for a future one because they, were going to, they are going to propose to you a false antichrist and a false messiah. That's the whole purpose of it. You have to understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. To say that it is yet future is to renounce Jesus as the messiah. Were it not for that grand delusion, there would be no ecumenical movement, and there certainly would be no Pope addressing a joint session of Congress this fall. Thanks, Yerk. Thanks, Walt. I'll see you next time. Thank you, Tom. So by this, I'm going to close the call and this broadcast today that was dealing with the Pope's coming visit to the United States of America later this year in 2015 in the month of September. I guess we will do another broadcast in due time, probably next week. Uh, keep out for the announcement of the broadcast on Conversation with Chocolate 66 on the page of Nothing But The Truth of Talk Show Radio from the Hair Show. And uh, then you will see and uh, probably will get notified when you are uh, signed into that. I thank you all very much for listening today and I hope that you all have learned something about the views that have been uh, made public to you and that you also understand that we are not only sharing here our own opinion, but we, we are sharing Bible prophecy and Bible truth with you. You know, when you talk about alternative media, uh, you have to understand that also most of the so-called alternative media is just controlled opposition. The cry of the real truth may be loud, but it is overshadowed by the cry of the lies coming out of the system that is Jesuit run and that is eventually run by Satan. And you have to understand that, that the God of this world at the moment is Satan and he rules it with his iron rod. And you can whether submit to his ruling or you can search real peace in Jesus Christ your Savior who died for you 2,000 years ago on the cross and shed his blood for your sins that you can do nothing about but repent of. In the name of Jesus Christ, we did this broadcast and I thank the Holy Father and Jesus Christ very much and the Holy Spirit, of course, for dwelling in us and make this broadcast possible and bring it out to as many people as you can, as Walt said already. Share this, make videos from it, anything you can do, to wake people up. Every soul that is not caught by Satan in his lies that you can save is a soul that not goes into hell and into perdition. So by this, I will end this call. Thank you, Walt. Thank you, Tom, for contributing. See you all next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>